Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I beg to move for the second reading of a bill shortly entitled Firearms Amendment. <clears throat> Unlike the previous bill, Mr. President, this bill is an amendment bill. And it really is, before I move on, we know that this was circulated previously, and so it was in the public domain, and also I'm hopeful that the leader of opposition business did receive it in the same package that he received the youth economy bill. I note also, Mr. President, as I begin my presentation, that he is not in this chamber. Again, I'm hoping that when he comes in, that he familiarizes himself with both what is in the bill and what I would have said before he seeks to make his presentation, so as to avoid a repeat of what happened earlier this morning. Mr. President, this bill, as I did mention, has had an, some public scrutiny and was circulated, and so you will notice as I go through the contents that there will be quite a few amendments proposed and quite a few suggestions that have been taken into consideration. The context here, Mr. President, is that in this country we have had reason to reflect on what we need to do as a government to deal with the surge or apparent surge of crime, particularly violent crime involving firearms. We have as a government and as a people to face the situation head on. We are not to make excuses, but to agree that this is something that we must respond to. And while we cannot solve crime only through the police and through legislation, while we accept that there are a number of other approaches and a number of other initiatives, both through infrastructure, through programming, and social interventions that we need to bring together to solve or to mitigate against crime or criminal activity, there are times when specific situations call for specific actions. In this case, Mr. President, we have an issue with the apparent overuse or frequent use of firearms in reported violent crime. And so as a government, we will not wait or continue to wait for the next case or the next assault or the next homicide. We believe that it is timely and we need to, in fact, it couldn't have been earlier. We need to do something. And this bill is just one of the many interventions that this government seeks to engage in to address a very ugly situation that we do not wish to escalate. Mr. President, one of the issues that confronts us is the issue of firearms entering this country through our borders, whether it's front door, back door, wherever. We are very much aware that firearms and ammunition seem to be entering our country and finding itself or finding a home in the hands of the wrong people. Mr. President, the access to illegal firearms, illegal guns, and ammunition is something that creates a potential hazard. A gun by itself is not as harmful as one that is loaded with ammunition. So while we deal with the firearms, we must also always remember that it involves the ammunition as well. Mr. President, for this reason, we believe that the first thing we need to look at is to see how we can regulate or have some level of control with allowing the issuance or the issuance of firearms. Who gets to own one or who gets to have one 
And if so, how does that person end up with one? Mr. President, we are proposing that provisions are being, should be made for the Firearm License Board, which is the organization that is going to be, or is, that should be responsible for issuing firearms, to be involved in the process of issuance of firearms, and that is legal firearms. Right now, what obtains is that a single individual in the person of the police commissioner is the one who, on his own, in his, on his own volition, decides who should or should not be a holder of a firearm. But we believe that this should not be left to the discretion of a single person, but instead the commissioner or police can chair the board, but that other individuals should be included. And so that takes me to a particular clause on page 12, um, clause 5-2-C, and it, 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 it reads, Mr. President, the minister shall appoint the chairperson from among the members of the board. And we are proposing that instead of the police commissioner being the sole person, that the minister appoints a chairperson for the board with other members, and that the commissioner, as it reads, quote, the commissioner is the chairperson of the board. So in that regard, the, the discretion is not being given to a single individual. Now, I know there were questions raised about whether the individuals who should be on the board, whether the, the board constitutes should be this person or that person, but whether it be individuals who um, are of a certain uh, association or a certain group, it is within reason to suggest that these individuals will have independent minds and would be more likely to make a more a fairer decision than vesting the uh, power in the hands of a single person. So instead of Honor just the commissioner... Honorable Senator, I have to stop you here because uh, we need six members to form a quorum. We, have, we do not have a quorum. Uh, so uh, we'll have to stop and wait yeah, till so somebody that. comes in. I suppose I can proceed now, Mr. President. You may continue. Um, and I want to say that it's, you know, it's almost as if some of our members will remain bound to this chamber and cannot leave because a certain member is never there. Um, I understand that sometimes we have urgent matters. You may have to do a washroom, something, but, you know, right after lunch, an urgent phone call or something, but. I hope the leader of government business can come in so that if someone else needs to take care of an urgent matter, it would not cause us not to have a quorum. Anyhow, Mr. President. <laughs> Mr. President, I also believe that in this, in this bill, there needs to be amendments made to take into consideration the penalties that are dished out to would-be criminals or would-be offenders. And persons caught in possession or persons who, would have, who should not have had um, firearms who end up with them. And so, Mr. President, in clause, in, on page 15, clause 6, we propose that an amendment be made in section 15. And that, in, that involves the penalty and we, we believe that, although it was previously suggested that it should be 10 years, but as a member had indicated, uh, most times when there's a 10-year sentence, by the time the sentence has been served, it's already been reduced by a watt or third. So the proposal is that this penalty be increased to 15 years. Um, so in that case, Mr. President, under Clause 6, 
um, amendment of section 15, clause 68A should then read, um, that's the last line, um, the 10 years should now be 15 years. Uh, Mr. President, similar, similarly, the amendment to section 16, um, clause 7, for persons who choose to try to interfere and modify firearms. These days we have some very creative people who can find very creative ways to do things that are not necessarily in the best interest of themselves or others. And they have developed the skill of taking firearms, certain caliber or a certain type, maybe a semi-automatic, and being able to convert it into fully automatic. And so once that is done, it makes the firearm a lot more um, lethal and more dangerous. And you do not want these things to be done. So if someone is caught or has decided to modify a firearm, the bill is proposing to amend section 16, clause 7, and for modification of a firearm, that the penalty be increased to 15 years as well. <laughs> Mr. President, I, I, thank, I thank Senator Aziz for returning with the leader of government business at this time, opposition business. Yeah, I really, I'm, I'm really thankful that he finally found himself where he needs to be, and he has returned. I hope that his colleague now briefs him on where we have been, and that he checks his, checks his notes this time before he attempts. So, Mr. President, clause in clause seven, we've just proposed to amend uh, section 16. Now, Mr. President, it is also true that in addition to just the issue of penalties and doing something to maybe penalize or sanction the persons who are offending, that we as a government believe that other support services are necessary. And this is why this government, Mr. President, has embarked on a number of other initiatives along with what we're proposing in this bill to help empower and assist our law, our, our agencies that deliver um, or that are responsible for upholding uh, law to be able to function. And I just want to cite a couple. In the last 12 months, Mr. Mr. President, we have increased the number of vehicles in our fleet for the police. We have provided, I believe, a minimum of 20 vehicles. That's about almost two per month to our police. The training vote, Mr. President. We have increased the resources on the ground. We had a situation in Viewfort. Right now, we have increased resources on the ground. And for security purposes, I, may, I do not wish to disclose all of that, but what I could tell you is that there are more resources on the ground in Viewfort as we speak. It may not be for a permanent situation, but hopefully we can have some measure of um, control, but at least there was need for it and we've responded. Mr. President, just a few sittings ago, we came here and we passed the domestic violence bill. That bill, you may not have, although some of us may not have seen the connection, that is a step in a direction towards mitigating against crime, particularly against women. Now, we must never forget that domestic violence, you know, men can be victims of that too. But there is an, an assumption that crimes committed against people in the home within the domestic environment um, is taken lightly. And sometimes it begins as a simple, you know, bit of verbal abuse or um, uh, minor, you know, assault, and then escalates into violent crime. People lose their lives. So, Mr. President, I want to propose that another change that um, is made is in clause eight, page 16, under section 21, and likewise to increase the penalties to 15 years. 
Mr. President, under Clause 9, page 70, prohibited weapons and ammunition. Again, that is a situation where people who are not supposed to have certain, I call them items, find a way somehow to end up with them. And under that clause, Mr. President, we are proposing that, the, that we delete A and B under that section, the entire section's A and B, and I hope the leader of government business is following at this time. And we include, so we would delete A and B, and after the word liable, that we insert the following, and I quote, on conviction of indictment to a fine which may extend to $200,000, or imprisonment for a term which may extend to life. Now, that was a previous um, um, suggestion, but we are proposing to amend uh, Clause 9 under Section uh, 21A to change from the 10 years and um, be the 15-year penalty be in included instead. Uh, Mr. President, there was conversation about um, licensed firearm owners. Probably in, this, in terms of this bill, we always seem to be talking about people who have illegal firearms. But licensed firearm owners also have a responsibility to secure and manage the firearms that they've been issued with. And so, we expect them as well to be subject to the penalties if they are in violation of the law. So I also want to speak to the issue of um, the management, the use, the security of firearms of persons who have acquired them the legal way. Not because you have been issued a licensed firearm that you should, be, you should feel that you have the right to be reckless and be irresponsible in the way you secure it, or you, um, you use it. Too often times I have seen people who own or carry firearms, don't, they, they, they seem to have very little discretion in the way they, they carry it or they brandish it or it's exposed or it becomes almost like a toy. In that case, I think we have to be very responsible um, so that when the government or the authorities have issued a, a firearm to you that you you be responsible. So in that regard, Mr. President, the, under Clause 11, the, it refers to the brandishing or showing off of a firearm in a public place. Um, that should not be acceptable. Also, persons who may decide to, for some reason, be under the influence of alcohol and drugs and whatever, and, and because of whatever influence they decide to maybe burst a shot or do, kind, to do these kinds of things that can cause, um, put other people at risk, at risk, even if you're a licensed firearm holder, these, these um, sanctions should apply to you. And in that regard, under section, um, under clause 11, the, the penalty should also apply to them. Um, the same 15 years um, should be uh, apply. Uh, under Clause 12, and before we go to Clause 12, Mr. President, another practice that is very common is that some people feel that they can use firearms to threaten other people. Just because you carry a gun and somebody else does not, doesn't give you a right to unjustly threaten people. A threat can be considered just as bad as the actual action. People can intimidate. I've seen it, I've heard people do it, and I think that is wrong. So people who would intend to intimidate or threaten others, make people uncomfortable, messing around and you know, using firearms for that purpose, and even if they are not real guns, as they say, um, I've seen people, I've heard of people who have been robbed with a water gun. It was, in, it was concealed in a, in, a, in a bag, it looks like a gun, somebody walks up to them, holds them up with a water gun, takes their money, and later on they find out that the person was carrying a water gun, but in their mind, they were, their life was at risk. So once you can create the perception in the mind of someone that you have, you have held them up or that you have intimidated them with anything that 
they believe is a firearm, you should be subject to the same penalty with somebody who had a firearm. So I believe that this um, clause in Clause 11, all of these uh, instances where people who are doing those things should be subject to the same penalties. Under Clause 13, or before 13, Clause 12, similarly, um, the last line in Clause 12 under Section 26, Mr. President, we propose that the 15-year um, penalty be applied as well. Clause 13 as well, same, the last line, 13, um, sec Section 27, um, 13 to A, replace the last 10 years, we propose that the 15 years should also um, apply. Mr. President, we move the clause 14 under the, the bill, in the bill, and there is also a tendency for people who choose to rent firearms. You may not believe it, Mr. President, but it has been alleged, at least from you know, common, common knowledge, that some of the firearms that have been used to commit some of the most heinous crimes in this country have been firearms that belong to legal license owners. And for some reason, somebody who does not have a license for it has been able to access it and use it. So if firearms that people own or have legally acquired are being rented or borrowed or whatever to people who are not licensed and they commit crime, then the person who owns the firearm should be held responsible as long as you can prove that it wasn't stolen for you, from you or something. Once you can't account for where it is, you are responsible for it. And both the person who used it and the person who, who it, was, it was taken from should be held to account. And again, it speaks to the issue of responsibility. The more you are in, in, endowed with, the more responsible you should be. So, Mr. President, under Clause 14 on page 19, um, subsection, the substitution of, sec of Section 28, again, the last line should should re, uh, re, read 15 years rather than 10 years. Uh, we now look at the issue of the tampering with firearms. Some firearm holders or some people, maybe after they've stolen a gun or they have one or they want to you know, reproduce something, they may decide to remove the serial number, tamper with various components of a firearm. And it's already illegal to do so. And even those who dispose, when people dispose of a fire, there are methods and there are ways in your training you're taught what to do. And if, you've not this, uh, if you're not upholding to, to these um, expectations, then there should be some kind of sanction. Also, Mr. President, with regard to um, trafficking, this is another one that I believe is very important where people... Um, aid and abet or assist in trafficking um, firearms and a fine of $150,000 has been promote, pro, proposed there. So that amendment would be also including up to the 15 year, um, the 15 year sentence and not 10 years. Uh, Mr. President, clause 15, again, similarly, we propose that the 15 years be replaced, the 10 be replaced with 15 years. Um, under Clause 16, Mr. President, we, under insertion of new sections 28.9 and 28, 29A and 29B, we propose to replace 29A, 29.2A, 29A2, and 29B2 with uh, the last two lines with 15 years as well. Clause 19, uh, Mr. President, this one, before Clause 19, let me go back to Clause 18. Uh, there are times, Mr. President, where I have actually witnessed it on the road. The police is attempting to do their work and issue roadblocks and ask people to stop. And because they know they are carrying something that they do not want the police to find out, they decide not to stop. I don't think we should be encouraging this. And so failure to stop or to adhere to a stop and search by the police with due process should also result in a similar penalty. And again, the 15 years would apply. And now to clause 19. There are some persons, Mr. President, who may decide to try 
to obstruct the act or the activity or work of the police in dealing with firearms. So if you are trying to obstruct another officer or an officer in, in his effort to deal with that matter, then you too would be subject to that same penalty. Under Clause 23, uh, Mr. President, this one is a general penalty, and we propose that the, the similar 15 years be uh, applied. And in cases of robbery and kidnapping, which are very serious, including involving the firearm, there, there was a proposal for compulsory imprisonment for up to 15 years and not for 10 years. And also for failure to disclose where you obtain ammunition from. And this one I think is a very interesting one because there are people who don't have firearm but they have ammunition. I mean, you can't take a bullet and throw it at someone. For you to have ammunition, you need to have a firearm. <laughs> to me, it doesn't make sense to be, what are you doing with ammunition if you're not a, a legal uh, holder of a firearm? And so there are people from, you know, it has been noted, where persons can obtain ammunition from persons, from others who have actually acquired it legally, and it finds itself in the hands of people who shouldn't have it. And even when they can't use the ammunition to match the firearm, that's when they, uh, if, they if, if what they can find is ammunition for firearm X, and I don't want to go into all the details, but they, they have access to firearm Y, they then modify firearm Y to use ammunition X. And the ammunition and the firearm were designed for each other. So when people try to use one type of ammunition to cause it to work in another firearm, you know that they're doing something wrong. And so there is, it's important that all of these be dealt with and to allow for there to be some kind of regulation and control of what is going on with all these firearm things in this country. But Mr. President, I want to also make a point about the approach that this government is taking. While we propose to strengthen the firearm legislation, and I believe even after we do this today, people become so creative that there's always something else that you're going to have to come back to do. If you, if you listen to some of the documentaries in what happens in prisons and how criminals can adapt and they can become, they can be so sophisticated, you almost have to, to prepare to come back to, to, uh, to either enact new legislation or to amend legislation so that you can respond. And sometimes it's even better to be proactive and anticipate what they're going to do. But Mr. President, I want to just tell the Senate that while we are trying to strengthen the legislation on firearms, this government is also doing a lot to strengthen both the physical infrastructure and the social infrastructure that can help reduce crime in general. So we're not only looking at firearms, although this is what this bill is about, but we believe that there are other things that the government needs to do and we have already started doing. I believe some of my colleagues will give more detail, but I'll just mention a few at this point. Mr. President, this is why this government has decided under the physical infrastructure section that I'll mention to upgrade um, and to, to get custody suites back in order. Because right now, Mr. President, it is painful to hear that a police station, police officers work hard to try and apprehend criminals. They have apprehended a suspect and they have nowhere to put the person. They have no place to house. Imagine you arrest somebody in Denry and you have to go and put the, keep them in a cell in Soufre. I mean, it's costing the state a lot of money. It's a, it's a threat to our security, moving people around. Custody suites, we all know what happened to it, Mr. President. I hope the leader of opposition business can stand up and explain how he intends to support this bill and help us to um, encourage the reconstruction of a place like custody suites. I think his government had other ideas. Mr. President, another example of physical infrastructure that is supporting some of what we're doing is the Grosley um, Divisional Headquarters, which is um, soon to be completed or soon to be um, made available to the people of the North. And also in the Prime Minister's budget, 
there was um, uh, allocation there. And I also want to mention at this point the rehabilitation of the Viewfort Police Station. Uh, the police have been moved to rent there and rent there. They're all over the place. Just because there was a little bit of mold, I think, or whatever happened in the roof. And instead of the government, the previous government, moving in and fixing the problem so that the police officers can make use of a beautiful building with all the facilities, allow the problem to become, I guess it wasn't enough to spend on it, allow the problem to deteriorate to the extent that the police officers could no longer occupy the building. And now the building requires major work that's going to cost us a lot more money than if they had addressed it when the problem um, started. Mr. President, I mentioned the vehicles, and we must never underestimate the value of these for police to be able to respond quickly to calls and, to, and for help. Social infrastructure, Mr. President, I did mention that we are not only providing infrastructure. Social. We understand the value of mitigating and doing what is known as prevention. It's one thing to catch a criminal after they've killed someone. You catch them, you send them to jail. Whatever you do to them, there are those who believe in capital punishment and tell you, hang them. And so, Mr. President, no matter what you do to someone who has killed someone else, you cannot bring back the one who has died. You cannot. And the family who is hurt and suffering and the children left behind and the deaths and the pain, no legislation, no amount of custody suites, no amount of arrest, nothing you do, no vehicles can deal with that. And so this government understands the need to put in place social interventions that can help to minimize and prevent a would-be offense that involves a fire. So while we're trying to remove the firearm from the hands of people, we're trying to deter them by increasing the penalties. We are also doing the following, Mr. President. We are providing educational support for our children in schools. And you want to ask me how that relates to firearms? There are young children now who have been found with guns. And they are using it to do activity to earn money. Children in schools. I was a school principal. There are teachers who still talk to me. Young children, girls and boys. And they see it as an alternative to earning a living. That is very scary, Mr. President. If these young children get the strength, the support they need in schools, they, they get their laptops, they get their supplies for school, they have uh, the, the, the family situation is stable and they can see why they should have an education. They will not need to think about anybody putting a gun in their hand so that they can make money. So we have to, to start by providing the support in the educational sector. And I'm happy that our government has found it necessary to increase the provisions made with CXC subjects, with bursaries, with facilities fees, and all the other things that I'm sure our other colleagues will talk about, to make this, our children's education more accessible and affordable so that they do not end up with a gun in their hand. They will not be easy prey for any baron or boss. Their boss will be their own boss. They'll think about it being their own boss, like what we spoke about in the youth economy. They think about being their own boss, so they ain't going to work for anybody for a few hundred dollars with a gun in their hand. Mr. President, the health sector, we may not think about it, but the health sector, if you have a healthy nation, people feel better about themselves, they are happier, they are less likely to get involved in unscrupulous behavior. Strengthening our um, short-term employment programs. I can tell you a number of young people who just tell you, boss, or sir, or Mr. Ferdinand, I, I frustrated. If I had something to do, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't be smoking, you know. I wouldn't be doing this, you know. I wouldn't have, that man wouldn't be my friend, you know. They almost feel as if there's nothing to do, so they find a way to engage. They bored and they unrestless, so they find a way to engage and do something exciting. And that exciting thing might be to go and find a gun and start messing around. Mr. President, I also believe that the youth economy is an alternative. It is one of those programs that helps to target a would-be um, gun holder or gun renter or gun handler. If people have money, they have resources, they have a livelihood, they don't need guns. They don't need it because there's nobody to, they, they, they're not suspicious of people. There's nobody to hurt. They look forward to doing things productive 
in the, in the, when they get up in the morning, they're thinking about how much they're going to make for the day and, how, and how, much, how much of their product they can improve. They're not going to think about whose house they're going to break into. So, Mr. President, I believe that strengthening our social infrastructure, the youth, at, the, the youth at risk program is another very good example. These are other programs that help to strengthen and give support to a bill like this one. Also, Mr. President, we have a situation where people who are vulnerable, vulnerable young people tend to be a good target for that kind of use or that kind of activity. And the people who are involved in this, they know who to target. They generally target the more vulnerable young people who they believe um, will be attracted to putting their hands on a gun. And so empowering them and making them less vulnerable reduces that risk. So Mr. President, the result of all of these gun-related incidents that we're trying to mitigate against, all it does is that it puts strain on the, uh, the already meager resources of the state, and the more we can do to minimize that, the better. Now, why this bill? After all that I have said about the support services, the social and infrastructural interventions, Mr. President, why this bill? Generally, if you look at a, a normal curve to explain the, the percentage of persons who get involved in violent crime and gun-related crime, in most societies, it's a very small minority. Most people in this country are good people. Most people are good people. They live an honest life. They go to work. They look after their family. Most of us are honest people. Some of us, or some of them, may find themselves in trouble from time to time, would have probably faltered. And if you put some measures in place, you pull them back. But Mr. President, there's always a, a small percentage, a very small percentage, and it varies in certain jurisdictions. In some countries, the percentage may be a little bit more, depending on like people, people, places like Japan, I heard they're very small, maybe Singapore, depending on the government system. And in other countries, the percentage may be a little bit bigger. But there's always going to be a percentage of people that despite every single intervention that I have mentioned, despite all that you do, will probably fall through the cracks and may find themselves, whether it's because of genetic makeup or whatever dynamic, may find themselves in the situation that the gun violence um, speaks to. And for these people, we must have something in place. Well, Senator, to you have 15 minutes to complete your presentation. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm wrapping up maybe just two more minutes. We must have something in place to respond. And this amendment, or these amendments, Mr. President, intend to target that particular tiny segment of the population, as small as they may be, can have serious implications and serious impact on the lives of the whole population. You only need two or three indiscriminate people holding a gun to cause major pain to an entire community. One gun can change the lives of an entire people in an entire village. So we don't, it's not about how many we have. One is one too many. And so this piece of legislation is really to target people who would have been involved in violent crime, particularly crime that is related to the use of guns and ammunition. So what we want to do is to bring that percentage to the smallest possible that it can be and to serve as a deterrent to would-be users of firearms and ammunition. So, Mr. President, I, I have attempted to give some context and explanation. I believe there's a lot more we can do. But for now, this piece of legislation is specifically, the amendments to it are specifically targeted to dealing with a particular problem at a particular time, which at this point is the issue of gun violence. It is not going to solve all crime in St. Lucia. It never will. But while we're doing so, we are also doing other things to address the whole management of crime as a government. I thank you, Mr. President, and I look forward to a very fruitful debate um, on this matter.
Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, once again, I stand in this Senate to present a rebuttal and to attempt to, among others, respond to the questions and comments raised by the Leader of Opposition Business. And Mr. President, for the third time today, once again, I'm speaking to an empty chair. Mr. President, let me start by acknowledging the contributions of all the members on this bill and thank them. I think we have all agreed that this is a very necessary amendment and that we have all acknowledged that there is reason for us to <coughs> pay attention to the situation in the country as it relates to gun violence. I will first address a couple of issues that were raised by the opposition with regard to gathering intelligence, the board composition, which in part has been addressed by one of my colleagues, and the role of the various persons and so on. First of all, Mr. President, I want to ask the opposition, because it's something that I think they have been hitting at from the time this bill was introduced. What is their obsession with the K-9 unit? I, I, I heard the K-9 unit, you know, yes, we, we, we acknowledge that this is important in terms of detecting um, the dogs being used to um, locate weapons, drugs, and other illegal items. But I, I kind of looked a little further than what was being said. And I asked, what is the obsession that the opposition has with the K-9 unit? And whereas this government has never said that we will dismantle and do not have anything to do with the K-9 unit, all the prime minister said was that he's going to review the contract. The contract that was um, uh, given for that unit. Clearly there are issues with the contract and the Prime Minister has a right to look at any contract and determine that it needs to be reviewed, have the review done and then fix the problem. There's no, there's no way in this debate or any time that this government has indicated that it's going to do away with the K-9 unit. So the K-9 unit argument has nothing to do with not wanting to help detect crime and drugs and, and guns. But I suspect this opposition has a particular interest in that K-9 unit. But I'll leave it at that for now. Mr. President, the opposition also raised the issue of the uh, firearm dealers also having to deal with the uh, firearms being seized if they're not following the proper procedures noted. The issue of conversion of firearms and increasing the, the sentence to life, I also note this well. I think Senator, Senate, Senator Stanislas raised an issue with explosives that he had hoped that would have been included, but I think if I am to refer to section 53, Amendment section 53 on page 24, I think there's reference made to bombs, grenades, and so on, um, which really are explosives. So perhaps the terminology, the specific term of dynamites, or whichever example you reference wasn't mentioned, but I think this, this is captured in that particular section. So I thank him for that observation. Um, the, issue, Mr. President, that I think got a lot of treatment was the issue of the composition of the board. And as was correctly stated by a former minister who spoke just before me, boards in this country have always been appointed by cabinet ministers. The former the Leader of Opposition Business is a former minister 
And I'm sure that he appointed several boards. In, pa in fact, I work in that very ministry now, and I can tell you, it's one of the ministries with the most statutory organizations attached. And so he would have had countless boards that he would have over, that he would have recommended or he would have appointed as a minister when the names were rec submitted to him. So to suggest that the boards in some way um, should not involve a minister or politician. I, in, in the first place, I don't see anywhere that we have suggested that the members of that board are going to be politicians. So I don't know if it is an expectation. As a matter of fact, Mr. President, if you look at the, um, the section here, I'll tell you, if you go to the, the um, to page 11 of the bill and look at section 2B under disqualification. It tells you who is disqualified. And among, and in that under, under section 2B, subsection A, it says he or she has not been a member of the House of Assembly. It also says on page 12 that he or she has not been nominated, nominated as a candidate of election and so on. Clearly, that does not suggest that whoever is going to be on that board to serve along with the Commission of Police will, or will definitely be a politician. So I do not know what the anxiety is about the board. It seems that all of a sudden the opposition is very fearful and worried about boards. They were in the business of appointing boards and I, I now notice the leader of opposition business is back as usual probably lost about what the discussion is and will want to interject. Mr. President, under the former Ministry of Tourism that I now serve in, I'll repeat for his benefit, this is one of the ministries with the most boards and he would have had an input, he would have appointed several boards, all of a sudden ministers can't appoint boards. Ministers must not be involved in appointing boards. Who appoints boards? Who appoints boards? So Mr. President, I will move to the composition of the board, which is another discussion point. There seems to be a contentious issue about the three persons being added to the, 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 the role of the commissioner to be able to decide whether or not a firearm license is issued. Mr. President, that does not... In anyway diminish the role of the police commissioner. I want to assure the opposition that it does not. The police commissioner is a member of this board and is the chair of this, um, of this unit, if I may call it that. The police commissioner heads it. And if we go to page 11 um, again, the police commissioner not only chairs the board, but if we read under, his func under the functions of the members, let me just get the relevant section, um, section 21. Section 21, um, it tells you that the police commissioner does, does not only chair the board, but he has a casting vote in addition to his original vote. So in the, the event that there is an indecision or a dispute in the vote, the, the person who retains the right to have the final say is still the police commissioner. That is not left in the hands of any other person. That tells you how important we believe as a government that the office of the police commissioner must still remain very relevant in that case. All the board does in, in, in bringing in the other three persons is to provide an additional layer of scrutiny. Is anything wrong with that? providing an additional layer of scrutiny? If you are so concerned about that, that it's, it's dangerous, how dangerous has it been when you have had a police commissioner doing, making the decision by himself? And as was questioned, who appoints the police commissioner? As we speak in our constitution, the prime minister has the authority to dismiss the commissioner. As we speak in this constitution, and it has happened before, former Prime Minister, the late Sir John, dismissed the commissioner because he had the authority to. Maybe it was justified at the time. I was a student at, 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 at secondary school when it happened. Dismissed the commissioner. Had him 
you know, to resign or whatever he did. So Mr. President, the Prime Minister is a politician. And if the Prime Minister has the legitimate authority to dismiss a commissioner, then it tells us that our system allows for politicians to be able to make certain decisions. That's why we elect them. The people elect politicians to make decisions on their behalf. But the politicians themselves, if they are unscrupulous, there have to be systems in place to keep them in check. And if it is a suspicion that the opposition has because they expect the government to behave in the way that they may have behaved, then I'm sorry. But Mr. President, if the, 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 the government says that the, the decision to bring in three additional persons, they never said that it was going to be three politicians. In fact, it is suggesting that they should not be politicians. It is very, very clear in the sections I quoted that you are becoming so suspicious, then it means you do not want a, an additional layer of scrutiny. And therefore, why was it okay that a single person could have done it before? It can't be any less dangerous now. Mr. President, also, the appointment of the additional three persons to the board in no way compromises or diminishes the role of the special branch in, in terms of the process of approval of the firearm. It does not, and there is nothing there that suggests that as soon as you have these the three persons added to the commissioner, that the role of the special branch is no longer required. It is not inferred or stated anyway. So, Mr. President, they still have to do the investigation. The due diligence still has to be done on the applicant by the board. It never referred to, it, there was no statement in the, in the bill that says that the special branch may or may not, it never mentioned the special branch. So everything that has happened is going to happen in addition to the three appointees. So let us say, Mr. President, that there were no additional appointees. As we speak, the special branch still has to do its due diligence before the commissioner makes the appointment. And so, and so if the amendment does not suggest that this is interfered with, the amendment speaks particularly to the board and its role, which comes into play after all the due diligence has been done. It is very clear, Mr. President. We are trying now to in introduce things into the bill like was done this morning. Of course, thankfully, you were able, uh, one of us was able to pick it up and clearly rule that the member had not, was, was trying to mislead the House. They are not going to be allowed to mislead this honorable House by trying to introduce things that are not in the bill. And I, as government, leader of government business, will ensure that it does not happen. Let us, let us stick to what the bill says. If there is ambiguity, you can ask for clarification and we will clarify. But do not suggest that there is something in the bill that is not in there. So the additional three persons on the board in no way interferes with the function of the commissioner of police or the role of the special branch. They will still have their own function. In fact, it gives the commissioner of police exclusive power in that if there is any casting vote, he has a casting vote. So it does not diminish his role. Mr. President, I want to also address a couple of concerns raised by Senator Lee. And he did mention um, something that has to do with the composition as well, but of course not in the very way that it was raised by the opposition. Um, I think some of the expectations that, and he, did, he cited the youth economy in one of the examples, um, and thought that it should also be the same for, the, for this bill. Uh, Mr. President, I believe that these expectations, for example, People should not, um, be, uh, should not have declared bankruptcy, should not be mentally unstable, um, and be convicted of criminal offense, and so on. Mr. President, in almost every single board, every single board that is appointed in this country, these conditions apply. It is a, it is a clear um, convention and expectation. Maybe if, if there is need to actually insert it we will not argue that, and we can have that considered for further um, review, of course. 
but it is a clear expectation, not only with that board, but any board. You clearly, if you have these things, you will not be eligible to be considered for boards. So, Mr. President, um, I think there was another, another point that was raised by Senator Lee under Section 14. Um, when it comes to the repair of firearm licenses, the same should apply for owners um, and persons who have illegal firearms. Um, I also noted <clears throat> at this time, Mr. President, I want to speak to the issue of um, the two issues raised by the leader of opposition business. Thankfully, he is here to listen to my response. First of all, the leader of opposition business started by saying that he's not going to politicize the discussion on crime. Now, when he said it, I, I took it with a, with a grain of salt. And thankfully I did, because the very next statement he made was that he cited examples after, just after he said he's not going to politicize it. His examples were particularly examples that were words that were uttered by previous prime ministers and previous politicians about crime. But you see, while he did so, Mr. President, he just pointed to what politicians said, except for one thing he didn't remember, the little statement with an accent that Kenny didn't but I will. He forgot that one, because he probably knew who said it. He, he, he repeated things that other politicians had said about crime, but he forgot that one. But at the same time, he's not politicizing crime. I wanted to stop this hypocrisy in this one. Come on. Mr. President, I was very fascinated when the leader of opposition business made reference to um, what I, I like it when we in this honorable house try to use best practice and make recommendations. It always is welcome. But it's interesting that he chose Japan. He read something there. And these days, what I see, the, the, the opposition seems to be an authority on everything. They come and they try to lecture us, the, um, the government, with all kinds of prescriptions and brilliant ideas that I don't know where they were in the last five years. But that's okay. If the idea is good, we'll listen, even if it's coming from the opposition. So the, so the leader of government business decides that he's going to offer some uh, a suggestion, and he uses a model from Japan, and he goes on and reads some fancy thing. Well. I wonder what inspired him to use Japan as an example. I wonder. But one thing I'll tell him, Mr. President, that in Japan, in Japan, no acting prime minister has ever and will never sign 30 direct awards in one day. That's a good model that I think he needs to pick up on because that does not happen in Japan. So when he comes here with Japanese um, I mean, we are in St. Lucia. There are so many countries around the region. There are so many models that we can... I have no problem with a model. Just so you want to come from, come to this house with selecting Japan. So when you choose your models, please pick up the good practices that these governments have. And maybe you can go back to one of your colleagues and tell them that that does not happen in Japan. I was heartened to hear some offerings that have some sociological and psychological basis. I think sometimes in our discussions about issues in this country, we are not inclined to pay attention and acknowledge proper scientific research. And I think I heard the, one of my colleagues speak about issues that uh, present sociological and theoretical perspectives on what happens when you implore or you use punitive measures. Even in, along the lines of education, it's also known that sometimes punitive measures are not necessarily the best, but there are times that they are necessary. And I welcome those. Um, the, the, the important message in that submission, I think, and I think it, most of it came from Senator um, Reynolds, was that punitive measures is a, are supposed to serve as deterrence. And when they serve as deterrence, the deterrence do, usually don't mean that the, the behavior will not be repeated. So you have to back it up with other things. So you may be able to curb a situation for a while, but if you stick to punitive measures alone, it's not going to give you a long-term solution for the problem. So you have to back it up with other more uh, concrete and effective measures. So I welcome that submission. And I believe that 
The discussion on this particular bill today, Mr. President, has raised a number of very important issues and has brought some serious uh, consideration, serious matters for consideration to us. We believe that the objective of, this, of these amendments is to help strengthen our fight uh, in reducing the number of illegal guns and ammunition that get into the hands of the, of the wrong people. And I hope that even going forward that we can consider how we can strengthen the legislation further so that we can bring some measure of control, sanity, and uh, regularize what happens with the use or misuse of illegal weapons, particularly firearms and ammunition, in this country. I thank you, Mr. President.